Welcome back. Today, I chat with Ross McGraw about heat training. This is a recent development for top tier teams because they're aware of a significant fact. As core body temperature rises, power output drops. One study revealed a staggering 5% loss in power for every one degree in core temperature increase. But there's two sides to this coin, because by exposing ourselves to heat in a systematic fashion, like Remco has been doing as part of his comeback. Here on my little screen, I have this little sensor next to my heart rate belt. I don't know if you can see it. It's uh, the core sensor. And uh, the goal is to go to 38 and a half degrees which means I will have fever on the bike. And that's the heat adaptation training actually, so. We can simulate the effects of altitude training. Today I sat down with the VP at the company responsible for driving innovation in this field, CORE. And we find out about heat training, what it is and how you can benefit from it. It's Ross McGraw. Ross, welcome to the Roadman Podcast. Thanks for having me. Excited to be here. Ross, Remco broke the internet a few weeks ago. He had a YouTube vlog. I hated Remco. I'm going to say that. I've never met the kid. Didn't know anything about the kid. I formed an opinion off and probably off one data point where I seen him like throwing a bottle or something. I don't like him. And I didn't. I held this opinion for probably 12 months until I seen his vlog. And then I'm like, ah, oh, he's actually a really nice guy. So... I kind of hold strong opinions loosely. So I've totally revised Remco fan now and I was watching his vlog. And one of the things that I found fascinating, and I know looking at the comments on Remco's video, because that's the kind of nerd I am, where I read through all the comments to get a flavor of uh, the temperature out there. Remco used a heat training sensor made by Core in that video. And everybody's just so curious what the hell is going on. What is it? And I know you're one of the men responsible for that product. So my goal for the podcast today is to dig into that, to help us understand what it is, should we be using them? I've seen a quote and I, it was attributed to you and it said, a study revealed a 5% loss in power for every one degree of increase in core temperature. Is that true? It's true. It's also not our you know study, which I think is what we tried to also look at. And this is this is probably the most exciting part about being at Core is we've made a device that's used universally by researchers, sports scientists, and athletes. And what that generally means for us is, you know, we we get to learn along with everybody else. So for for that particular study, they were looking at I believe it was a one hour time trial. Um, but that was the findings and it was just us reporting the findings. So we didn't have anything to do with that, but it was a great illustration of why is thermal power important? And I think that's what everyone kind of like has the initial thought about is like, okay, I understand what power in my pedals is and why that's important. Why is thermal power important? And I, I think that's a question we get quite often. I even had a precursor to that question. As soon as I heard about people using heat, I assumed when I seen the device that it was measuring just skin temperature because my basic understanding of it as a, you know, someone that grew up as a kid and little sister and stuff at the time, if someone's getting their temperature taken, it goes in under their tongue or it goes in internal to measure the body temperature. And I seen that I'm already curious as to how they're measuring temperature with something that sits on the surface. Maybe let's start there. Yeah, I, that's what we've seen quite a bit of is people aren't, the, the first thing you have to sort of break is that that blurring of lines we all grew up with, I think, which is like ah, skin temp, core temp, what's the difference? What's your temperature is kind of the way I grew up yeah. thinking about it. And the real difference is this, if you're looking at the vitals and, and, a, and a metric, you want the one that that is closest to what's truly going on, right? And, and in this case, the the body, the center of the body where all the organs are and and that's what's changing how your body's functioning. Skin temperature is, you know, sort of the the correlation, not the causation. If your core temperature is changing, that's a bit slower. It has larger ramifications. Your skin temperature 
you know, I can blow, you blow on your arm, your skin temperature changes very rapidly. And it's not really a great indicator of anything aside from how you feel at the moment. In fact, the chip that we've developed, the heat flux sensor that we use in our calculation, that heat flux sensor, essentially another name for it is G-skin. We called it that because it mimics skin. And humans are historically bad at telling what's going on with our core temperature. We, we actually don't know. We, can, we have a good sense of heat flux or energy transfer. So if you touch like a piece of metal or something like that and you feel it's cold, we all know it's the same temperature as the rest of the room. It's the same. But what you're feeling is the energy leaving your body and going into that more dense, let's say, object. And that's really what we're feeling. And it's a self-preservation mechanism. So it's really good, right? You're going down a descent. This is a real example. We had some heat flux data and some core temp data. And we we're looking at the descent and the rider, this particular rider had crested a climb. They're quite wet, right? They've been sweating the whole way up. Halfway down the climb, the jersey dries out. You know, they probably felt really cold in the beginning. And that's why you see them tucking all the stuff in the jersey, right? Halfway down, it dries out. And that would probably feel good normally because the sensation of being cold is gone. And the rest of the, the descents, they continued and then went up the next climb. Now, that's a pretty normal occurrence, but the science would actually tell you, okay, if we look at their core temp, their core temp did not drop as low as we, could, we would want it to go. Meaning the actual scientific better thing to do would have been to dump water again halfway down the descent, let's say, so that you continue to drop your core temp until you get all the way to the bottom and start the next climb. That's fine. Which doesn't feel good, but like sometimes not yeah. feeling good. I mean, I don't think an ice vest during a warm up probably feels good, but it's going to get your core temp lower before you start that time trial. And that's obviously not quite common. Okay, so let's explore why having the core temperature lower actually makes a difference. So maybe to ground this in, like, what is the relationship between what are the variables at play here? Is it power, heart rate? And temperature. What's the interplay between the three of these, and why is it why is temperature an important addition to the normal two variables we use with just power and heart? Rate? Yeah, I'll I'll give the. I'm going to apologize ahead because the analogy is is maybe not the best one, <laughs> but the if if you are if the body is a thermal engine, and this is actually how the entire business started. So. Wolf uh, started the business. He's the founder, the CEO of GreenTech, the parent company, and also of Core. And he comes from an engineering background. So he's watching Sarah True uh, at Ironman Frankfurt, and she's coming down the, the finishing stretch, and she basically collapses, isn't able to finish. And that was when he realized that basically the human body is similar to just any other thermal engine. So we understand pretty well power in pedals, uh, the mechanical power, that 20%. But the human body being rather inefficient, that means that another 80% needs to be dissipated through heat. And we have very little, historically, we've had very little understanding of that thermal power. And that's gross efficiency, essentially. That's the gold standard for sports scientists. So with core, you now have an ability to monitor with a non-invasive continuous solution thermal power in the form of core temperature. Olaf, who I think you've had on as a guest, even looks at just the raw yeah, heat flux times. data, the raw energy transfer, because he's running all the numbers on gross efficiency, things like that, which is not a normal use of data, but he is not a normal human being in any regard. Um, and I mean that in a positive way, but... <laughs> yeah, we had a 30 minute podcast at the start for all of it. I think we scheduled 45 minutes and we recorded for 30, 35 minutes. And we pressed stop and we talked off air. And both of us were like, Did it feel like we needed like four or five hours for that conversation? And he's like, Yeah, I've got five hours on Monday. Let's do another one. <laughs> so we just had this open ended podcast on Monday where we just talked. Try put a title on this podcast. We talked about 60,000 different topics. That sounds 100% accurate. He's, he's a true renaissance man. man. Great yeah, guy. Yeah, great guy. Amazing human being. Huge advocate for core. And that's, that's what's been so cool. I mean, he even imagines different ways of using the product. And that's what I talk about is like, 
we make the technology. So the core sensor is using three major inputs to calculate core body temperature and the algorithm. It's using the skin temperature so that we can, and, and heart rate, and those are to eliminate noise a lot of times, and then heat flux really to measure that energy transfer energy exchange. And that allows us to get a pretty accurate view of core body temperature outside of the other options, which are EPIL. Um, yeah, it, it's still around, but be quite costly. And as far as being having an EPIL in your system on the open road, there's a lot of concerns about you know ending up in an MRI or something like that with an EPIL in your system. And then the other option is a rectal probe. And I don't think I have to go into too much detail about why that's not a popular solution for most riders, but... <laughs> Anyway, it's it's now, okay, now there's a continuous non-invasive way to get core temp that opens up this thermal aspect. So now we have mechanical and thermal power uh, and arguably the 80% is more important than the 20% if you think about impact in that equation. Like historically, I have had this experience. Like I've been coming in from university years ago and late at night, my college classes didn't finish till like 10 p.m. And, you know, on the way up and cycling, you're still super motivated. So I'm like, okay, I've got two hours to do. I'm starting at 10 30 and finishing after midnight. But I'm training in my bedroom and I have one of these old school turbo trainers way before a walk bike was out. And the bedroom is just getting warmer and warmer. And I did have a power meter. Uh, I've told this story on the podcast before, but it's a funny one. So I'll tell it again. I was in university and I was looking around. I was like, I can't afford a coach like that ongoing cost, but I could do a once off cost because I could con the bank into telling them I need a, a car to go to university. So I told the bank I needed a car to go drive in now to university. And I bought a SRM for 2,500 or 2,600 euro. So I had my power meter and I had my heart rate data and I'm stuck in this stuffy, warm bedroom in my parents' house with the heating on. And I'm just noticing that as the session goes on, I'm on the same power, but my heart rate's going up and up and up. The cost of the effort is just getting higher and higher and higher. I thought that was heat. I'd open the window and it'd have a little bit of an effect. I'd put on a fan and it'd have a little bit of effect but I didn't have data to validate that that was heat. And I definitely didn't have data to say, hey, for every half a degree, my temperature goes up. This is the effect on my performance. Yeah, that's, you know, that's a bit of the challenge that we've had as well is how much do you generalize to give that kind of intuitive feedback and how much do you give people raw data? And it, it's, I'd say all wearables struggle with this. It's counterintuitive. You, you want to give an intuitive data point, but that means you have to make generalizations. Um, so yeah, for each individual, that number is going to be different. Uh, but what we've tried to start doing is giving a little more knowledge there in not taking away the access to the raw data, but trying to give some guidance with zones. So we've tried to define the zones. And really what we're looking at is with the zones using skin temp and core temp as factors, which is something that we've noticed a lot of importance towards. So for example, the science behind uh, heat training, if you have a really high core temp and you're in a cool environment, the science basically says that like, hey, you can still be quite efficient there. You're not going to immediately lose power. But if you're in a hot environment, your skin temp is high and your core temp is high, the impact on power can be quite dramatic. And as you pointed out, if you try to maintain the power, you, you'll start to see heart rate decoupling. It's no longer directly linked to your power. It's the heart rate just getting out of control. And that's one of the markers that we would look for. with If we're talking to a sports scientist or a coach, they're looking at power and then the heart rate and the core temp, and they're trying to see where is that decoupling occurring when your core temp and your heart rate kind of go out of whack and, and things sort of decouple a bit. Um, that's really interesting if you're like that scientific, but for somebody else, we want to define a zone of like, okay, if your skin temp and your core temp are here, the algorithm and, and the science tells us this is a good zone for heat training. It's also where you start to ironically lose power. So we're trying to equate this to ways people can use it. Zone three is where defining it is up. I, ironically, the zone where you start to lose power in a significant way, it's also the ideal heat training zone. So if you're going to spend like an hour on your so bike... Is, 
so is this unique though for everyone? So, yeah, yeah. you know, if we're talking zones, you know, I'll go out and do a threshold test, you'll do a threshold test or whatever way we arrive at our threshold figure. And we'll both come back and plug it into our Garmin and now we'll know what zone we're in. Your zone two might be 400 watts, my zone two might be 200 watts. We're two different riders. Is there two different baseline temperatures or do we just run at basically the same temperature as humans? Right now we are running it... So the zones is more generalized guidance right now because we don't yet have the ability to give more individualized guidance. But the reality is exactly what you're saying. You know, at the end of the day, it is very individual down to the fact that we're doing quite a bit of studies with some of the women's teams that we work with, uh, specifically around menstruation and how that changes core temperature. Uh, recovery changes core temperature. There's a bunch of different factors that change maybe even your Just own. time of day? Time of day could change, yeah, your core temperature. So I think for each individual, it's going to vary. Now, the challenge we've tried to use is like, okay, what can we define? And in this case, what's the objective? So the objective is try to give people clear guidance of when they're going into a zone where they're going to lose a lot of power because that's really valuable in a race. And we've had two of those. Yeah. And then the same on like uh, heat training, right? You, danger is really important. We want to flag that. And of course, if you're a high performing athlete, you know your body well enough that like, okay, you're okay here for a little while. But if you're doing heat training and you're anywhere near the danger zone, what's the point? Because then you're, you're actually taking, you know, potentially recovery away from your body and you're not able to recover and do the next session. And you, We've seen tons of athletes that are doing without core, let's say, key training sessions, and they're seeing worse results because they're they're overcooking themselves essentially. Yeah. So okay, I'm a bit slow on the uptake. So yep. let me kind of paint a picture on this. So if I the, the two applications I'm thinking about are the two different sides to this coin. So I'm in a race. Does it connect into your garment at the moment? I have a connection in so I've picked up one of the core temperatures and playing around with it. But I'm essentially like I was with my power meter 20 or 20 or 12 or years ago, whenever I got up before I read training and racing with a power meter from Andrew Kogan. It was just really a number that when I stood on the pedals hard, it got big. When I came off the pedals, it got light. It's kind of like that for me at the moment. It's just another number on the screen. I'm like, I don't really know what my baseline is, so I don't know what my deviation is. But off what you're telling me, I'm kind of envisaging a situation now where I'm in a race and I'm noticing as I'm cruising along in the bunch that I'm at zone two power, my heart rate is maybe upper end the zone two, even though my power is normalizing around lower end the zone two, but my temperature starting to creep up to zone three or zone four. So I can take action, like take off a gilet, start to dump water over my head to take that temperature back down to try and get my heart rate, power and heat zone more aligned. That's coin, that's the heads of the coin, to flip onto the tails of the coin, I'm thinking about it as the exact same situation, but that's the effect I'm looking to achieve. Exactly. I'm out on a training ride and I'm looking to actually spend time in zone two power, but get my heat zone up to zone three. So I might overdress for this session. Is that my interpretation right? Yeah, yeah. Or am I totally No, you're absolutely that? right. So the we, we were sort of, if you were reading through like all the material we put on the website, we've tried to like condense the science, but we're, we're sort of saying the paradox of heat zone three because three is the most important one. It's where you get, uh, you know, if you're training, that's your optimal heat training zone. That's where you're going to get the optimal adaptations. And when we talk about that, we're going to say, yeah, you know, you're getting vascular dilation benefits. You're increasing your hemoglobin, um, and you're, you know, ultimately going to get performance gains from that heat training as long as you're accumulating it over time. Um, and then exactly the opposite, right? If you're in zone three and you're racing, that means you're starting to see those decoupling happening and you need to be cooling yourself if you want to continue to perform at a high level. So if you've got a nice slushy, if you have a nice sock, if you're racing on a bike, that's an option. There's some really cool technology that I can't talk about because uh, it's not really quite common yet. But in the tour, you'll see other methods of cooling in the race that will start to be more prevalent. We've also seen a lot more bottles. You mean they've innovated on their women's tights filled with ice? Yeah, you know, right? I, I think that's a low <laughs> bar, but you will finally see innovation beyond <laughs> women's tights. 
<laughs> Thank goodness. Um, but so yeah. You're, go, you're going to hate me for this question because it's one of those ones that any entrepreneur, especially the product developing as fast as yours, you're trying to go in a million different directions. But when are we going to see it? Because this sounds amazing. It's like, okay, I want to use this, but I want to see the data on training peaks. Like I want to know in the same way that I know I spent 80% of my session in zone two and it was a zone two session. So I'm like, okay, I've got work to do. 20% of my session wasn't in zone two. Let's improve upon that. If I go out to do a zone three heat acclimation session, how do I actually know I spent my time in zone three? So I've got one answer for you. The good news is in the core app now, before, after your workout, you've got that. You'll see that. Um, there will be a, a metric that will actually show how much your body's sort of adapted in the future. Um, so that that's one way to do it. During the workout, of course, if you have the app open, you can be doing that as well. However, we realize that that's not most people. So within Garmin, you can actually access the zone data. Uh, you'll be able to see the zone data in time on your Garmin device. So that means oh, that's during good. the workout, you can do that. The problem we still have, and this is our own you know, issue, is a year ago, we didn't have these zones and we didn't have the adaptation score. We didn't have an easy ability for the average user to understand what's, what's going on, how to put these pieces together. You had to have a PhD in, or you know, sports science knowledge to really do it. That now is not the case, which means we've been having conversations with all the people you're mentioning on, okay, now that we've done the work to have a foundation that's easier to understand, how can we bring that to your platform? Because the mission that we've had is, okay, now two-thirds of the pro peloton is using this thing. We have 10 world tour teams officially, you know, or very obviously using it. If that's the case, what we need to do is make this something that others can use, maybe if they're just racing on the weekends. And we've just started to get yeah. to that point. And now you've identified which is the next natural step, making that easier to view on these other platforms as well. Yeah, I'd love to know. I must reach out to some of the, the coaches and like see how they're using it. Like, what does a what does a session look like? What does how does a weekly training plan change? Is there now dual goals of like I guess I guess there's always been dual goals, isn't there? Because we're you're looking at duration, you're looking at intensity, but now is there a tertiary goal where you're looking at also heat adaptations? Maybe actually that's not a bad place to to go with this conversation next because it's still. I guess I know how to do it now, but my buy-in is probably still a little hesitant because I'm a little fuzzy on the why. Why would I spend my time in zone three and not in zone three heat training and not just focus on my normal bread and butter, especially if I'm a time crunch rider? Yeah. That's a really interesting question. And we've seen, I'll try to share a few examples because I, I don't think there's a right answer. I think you hit on it earlier athletes are individuals. And what we've seen is what works for one doesn't necessarily work for the other. So I'll share a few examples. And then the whole yeah, point of the okay. device is that you experiment with what works best for you. So yeah, you should look at how you perform if you're doing sessions. Are you getting better? Are you getting worse? But now you have a metric to determine how you can adjust. So one example would be uh, we have some athletes that use heat training. Uh, Remco, for example, is using his heat training to actually almost like pre-prep for his altitude camp. Um, really interesting to see. Um, an example of a session for that would be, you know, maybe one hour within your zone three, let's call it core temperature, and, you know, roughly three days a week. And you'll begin to see those adaptations pretty rapidly. Uh, and over two to three weeks, you'll, you'll start to see some, some pretty... Pretty significant adjustments. What we've also seen is so, yeah, go ahead. What, what are the for, sorry before you jump on to the next one? Uh, what are the adaptations on that he's looking for? Like, are they physiological markers that we can measure? That's where we came up with the adaptation score. Is it's hard to measure that stuff. I mean, if you're chesting your okay. your blood, I guess you could look at that. <laughs> but like, for example, measuring your your vascular dilation when you're when you're actually riding, it's really difficult to do. I don't. I'm not aware of any way to measure that. Um, I'm not aware of any, it, there are ways actually. So one thing you could measure is sweat rate. Your sweat rate will change and adapt to be more efficient, even the contents of your sweat. And there's quite a few devices out there that are trying to, 
uh, deliver those metrics. Um, so that's something you could look at if you have lots of really cool um, gadgets flying around. Um, the easier one to look at actually is just, again, power and core temp. If you're doing the same session, what you'll start to see is your at the same power threshold, your core temp will be lower. That's, I mean, it's, that's an easy way to look at it, right? You're being more efficient. Your thermal yeah. power is lower to hit the same mechanical power number. Your, your efficiency is better then. So, I mean, it's yeah, rudimentary, that's but it, that you and I can do that on, on our Zwift ride, you know, tomorrow. It's easy to look at. Yeah, no, I love that. What was the second uh, example before I cut across you? Uh, the other one we've seen is it's more interesting. It's this passive heat sessions. So an uh, example would be, okay, you've gone out, you've done your hard ride, and then you try to continue that hard ride. So maybe overdress a little bit, um, but to continue that heat benefit and prolong it, some athletes are or coaches are prescribing you know, time in a warm bath, sauna, or you know, doing maybe another hour or so easy on the trainer to just keep the heat going that you've built up from the end of maybe that longer session. So what they're trying to do is get that passive heat without actually burning as many you know, watts on the legs. So it's interesting. It's kind of like trapping it in and having your body deal with trying to dissipate. You're still getting that adaptation. So those are examples that we've seen. Um, what works best for each individual I can't tell you. I mean, it, it's it's quite interesting how drastically different we've seen. And these are high-performing coaches and individuals. It, it's interesting to just see what's out there. So I don't know if it's there's consensus yet on what's best. In fact, there's quite a few secrets, I'm sure, about what's best and, and who's using what. Rob, man, I know how serious you take your goal setting, whether they're fitness or life-related goals. If you're looking for a powerful alloy to support you on this journey, look no further than Huel. Huel has become my secret weapon for when I don't have time to prepare a balanced meal. It ensures I get the nutrition I need without sacrificing time or taste. Plus, it stops me from reaching for that takeaway menu. I always throw a bottle into my backpack when I'm heading into the city to work and it stops me eating junk convenience foods, snacking on croissants and bars of chocolate because I know they don't support my training goals. It's a handy nutritious meal on the go and it's got over 22 grams of protein. Huel is perfect for athletes that don't have time to cook or prepare food before a training session. It's convenient, nutritious fuel at your fingertips, ensuring you hit your daily fueling needs for that session. Huel Ready to Drink has 26 essential vitamins and minerals in every single bottle. You're getting a whopping 175 health benefits. Plus, it's made from natural ingredients like tapika, sunflower seed, coconut, and more. The best part, it's the flavors. There's eight crazy, beautiful flavors. Iced coffee is what's in my backpack right at the moment. You can get Huel directly to your home. All you got to do is head on over to the Huel website, huel.com forward slash roadman. What's the knock-on effect on hydration levels? Obviously, as temperature rises, sweat rate's going to rise. As you said, the composition of that sweat might change. And actually, something really interesting I learned speaking with uh, Dr. Alan Lim, physiologist who worked with Team Garmin for years, which I never knew that sweat rate and thirst are, there's a strange interplay between them. Because we, if you drink a drink that has too high of a concentration of electrolytes and salts, so you'll drink that and your body will turn off the thirst signal when it's got 100% of its electrolyte needs. But because it's got 100% of electrolyte needs doesn't mean it's got 100% of its water needs. So the thirst signal is switched off purely because you've drank enough electrolytes, but you still need extra water. And then the converse of that as well, if you haven't, if there's not enough electrolytes in it, you'll drink water and your thirst signal will be switched off because you've met the water needs, but you actually haven't met your salt needs. So you're underperforming in both cases. So hydration is vastly more complicated than I ever understood. And I'm just contemplating me using this device now and saying, am I going to dig myself into an even further hole here because I don't understand the changing sweat rates of exposing myself to heat training? It's a, it's a real problem. I think they're two, the way I look at it is, is two slightly separate challenges, right? They're, 
there's an entire work stream. There's separate devices. There's entire labs dedicated to the sweat science. And um, yeah, I, I agree with you. It's rather complex and I'm constantly fascinated by it. In fact, we actually work with quite a few of them because there's obviously an interplay between your core temp and, and maybe your sweat data. But they are slightly separate in the sense of... Uh, you don't actually need to fully understand the sweat component to, to get the benefit. I think you brought this up. I had the same experience. I was a, a pro triathlete, you know, certainly not anything of note, but good enough. And I had a day job while I was doing it. And, but I was, I was doing kind of the same thing and banging away at the, on the trainer indoors, sweating profusely, still hitting my power numbers. And what I was noticing personally, this is my own experience, is I would actually sweat less at those same power numbers that I was being prescribed by my coach because my body was adapting. And, you know, from my looking back at that, I, I was able to keep my core temp lower at the same power number. So, yeah, I mean, that's what I was seeing. Could I have pushed maybe further then? Would that have been more beneficial? I don't know. That's the science. I'm not a yeah. sports scientist, but it's really interesting. That's what I noticed though. It's like that is the interesting part, is it's like you got your adaptation. If we change yeah. the stimulus now, will you exactly. get another step up on the adaptation maybe, ladder? Maybe I had peaked, maybe I hadn't. And and that's I think what's super cool is like if I had had some of this data, maybe I would have kept pushing or or done more. You could have been like Jan Ferdino. Yeah, right. The The difference I will say <laughs> is, you know, heat adaptation is is similar to altitude in a lot of ways. And one is the the general sort of, okay, if you increase your, your plasma volume, generally what happens is the red blood cells fill in. So the the research sort of shows that it's it's a somewhat similar thing. It's not done in the same way. It's not just raw red blood cells right away. The other similarity is... Um, I would say the the amount of time it generally takes, it's usually a roughly about the same time to get adapted. And then the third similarity is the there's there's a max, right? Like you, if you spend your whole life at altitude, it, like it doesn't necessarily get much better. So, you know, you, yeah. you do an altitude camp and you kind of hit a certain level and then that's it. And it's sort of the same on the thermal side from what we've seen is at least in the shorter term studies and things that you look at, like once you've adapted, you've adapted. And then you can go into maintenance mode and focus maybe on other ways to optimize your performance. And certainly making sure that you don't lose it is important. Once you've done the work and you can maintain it more easily. And that's really interesting. And then the fourth thing I would mention and final one is a difference. The big difference though is most of us can't do two weeks in Tenerife for whatever. You know, it's a lot easier to get on the Zwift machine in the basement and crank up the temperature uh, than it is to go on a two week yes. uh, holiday for, for most athletes. And, and that's a big difference here. It's an extra stress though. It's an extra stimulus. So do you have an insight into how, how coaches are dealing with this? Because if someone listening to the podcast now has their coach and the coach plans out their weekly training sessions and now they take their weekly training sessions and they just decide to do some of them to also get a heat adaptation. I had this debate recently with a client where he decided to start adding in like five 30-minute sauna sessions a week into his training session. I was like, well, it's fine if we want to talk about sauna and we want to talk about heat shock proteins, but we're adding an extra stress. So we need to adjust something else because we're looking for an adaptation. We're looking for a response to training, not just to get green boxes and training peaks. We have an output goal. We're looking to go fast in bike races. How are coaches or how do you recommend the interplay of training duration intensity with adding extra heat training protocol into a week? That's a great question. Again, it's going to be somewhat individual. I'll give some examples. And then that way, hopefully it gives people something to play with. The first thing I'd say is it's 100% that, right? Like, Don't do this without consulting your coach because it is another stress. If they haven't planned it then and you're just adding it in, you're going to throw off everything they're planning. So uh, we have over 150 coaches on our coaching program. That's not you know, any of the, I'm not including our world tour teams. This is just more age group and, and even some others outside of that. But the reason we grow that program is that we spend a lot of time educating and providing information and even allowing them to exchange information between coaches because 
they can then take the time to individualize it to the athlete and look at their biomarkers. So they should look at all your raw data and and probably adjust to what you're doing. Um, I would say there's a couple examples. So like if you're if you have like two weeks and you have a training block, the same way you would treat like an altitude training camp, maybe reduce some of your other stresses, go for more like volume, less intensity, things like that. If you have two weeks, you can get pretty heat adapted pretty quickly if you're doing a session essentially every day. So if you did, let's call it six sessions, uh, six heat sessions where you have enough time in your heat training zone over that uh, period of time, so six per week, so 12 sessions, you can get to like a top level, you know, pretty high level of heat adaptation. That's quite good. Yeah. If you then kind of look at it the other way, we have other uh, programs where if you're, you know, if you have six weeks and you're doing, let's call it two to three sessions per week, you can get to, let's call it 60%. Like you can still get benefit, right? And that's still good. And that's still important, but you're going to get like a 60% of your maximum adaptation over that period of time, if that's the number of sessions you're doing. And then if you drag that out, maybe even further, um, you know, you look at like a 12 week period with two to three times per week, then again, you're, you're going to get to like 80% there. The interesting part is once you've then, those are examples of like different ways of doing it. Once you've hit like a high level, once you're at like the 80%, let's say it's a lot easier to maintain. So then you could go down and you could do maybe two heat sessions per week. Um, and that's going to give you, you know, enough to maintain essentially that 80% for, for weeks and months and months. So I think that's what we've seen a lot of is like coaches really playing with that of like what works for you as an individual, right? Are, how yeah. long, how long can we have? Do we have two weeks and we're going to pack it in and really focus on this? Or are we adding this as a supplement to your weekly training to get you there and get you adapted ahead of a hot race? And then we're going to maintain, you know, so that we aren't stressing you, right? The maintenance is lower stress. So maybe before your event, you can back off. You're only doing one or two of these sessions and you're able to recover a little bit, but maintain the benefit the same way you would do it with like volume and training, let's say. So I would say that's where the coach really comes in. It's like, you need to really think about it as a stressor. And the data just allows a smart coach to do that. Can you do a recovery ride in recovery heart rate, recovery power, and zone three heat training? It's, it's going to be difficult to do. I wouldn't say it's impossible, but you need enough mechanical power like if you overdress a lot, right? Like let's say you, you've got a heat suit on, um, maybe a couple extra layers. If you're in a really hot environment, you can put out less power. But what I would imagine is your heart rate would probably also be relatively oh, high. Yeah. So I don't have a specific answer. Like the question for is, that. is it a recovery, <laughs> is it a recovery ride even? Yeah, like, it I, is, wouldn't, it's a I would look stress. at it as a workout. Right, like it, it is a heat training session. If you say it's a training session, I wouldn't, I wouldn't consider it recovery. The only exception I would make here is if you're able to at maybe the end of a, uh, let's say at the end of like a zone two ride, if you're able to eventually get your core temp high enough by overdressing and then go inside and lower the intensity but trap the heat that's where we see that working. So I haven't seen specific power number on that, um, but maybe that's possible. And and that's, again... It's fascinating. Like, I have a million questions on this. <laughs> no, like, this I actually, oh, you know, I have, I have friend, a great answer for you, I'm sure. But, like, I'm trying to give generalized responses so people can really play with it as individuals. Because if you have a core and you have, have your power number, ago, you should uh, be able to, right? Yeah. I had a friend years ago and he was training for Kona age group. And he was living in Ireland. Obviously, we don't have a lot of that extreme heat that is people athletes experience in Kona. So his solution, this was real back in the day, bro science. He took his turbo trainer into a sauna that he constructed in his shed, like built out the full wooden sauna, infrared, and he was riding in there. And just as you were talking there, I just got this flashback of him in the sauna sweating away, doing his four-hour sessions. 
he was getting ready for Kona. Is there a difference between heat acclimation training and daily heat exposure training? Slight. I mean, it's really, it comes... It's just a actually, protocol I'm, difference, I'm going to steal from Olaf one more time, but he always talks about like the purpose, right? You train for a race. So really it's what is the purpose? Are you trying to adapt to perform at that race or are you trying to get some performance gain for any race uh, instance? So I would just say the main difference there is what you're trying to achieve um, and the mental aspect too. So... It's funny, DCR actually did this for his wife. Uh, he built her like a whole box preparing for Kona uh, to do heat sessions, but she was using core. We were doing this whole thing and it was exactly that, you know? And it's interesting because there's a mental aspect to being prepared to race in the heat for that long. And especially if you're not in a warm environment. So physiologically, it's essentially the same thing, but from a mental and from a preparedness standpoint, what you're trying to achieve, it, it's it's quite different. Yeah, because I know we have a lot of uh, pro athletes, uh, World Tour runners listen to the podcast and so many of them are already checking the weather forecast for Paris and they're looking at it and going, Ooh, it might be a warm day for the Olympics. Yeah, we've gotten a few call, right, phone calls. To to, think yeah, about. They're definitely thinking about it. Yeah. Actually, so uh, over the past week, we we were in, in Berg in Norway with uh, with... Christian and and with his team though, but what we were looking at is not just his core temp and his heat training. We were looking at thermal properties of the kit he's wearing. And Olaf, you know, of course, was talking about how they've optimized for aerodynamics and everything. And he was like, look, but maybe that's one percent. Right? But one percent like everyone's arrow at this point. Everything's been super arrow. Yeah. What he was saying is he believes that the kit is now. 10 to 20% better from a thermal perspective. And that's huge. And that's that's incredible to look at is simply because it hasn't been paid attention to as much, there's a lot more room for innovation in the thermal side of the sport. And it makes so much sense. Like all of us have that experience who have raced at any level where you have a kit that's just, you, you never perform well in that kit. You always overheat and feel terrible when you wear that jersey or you wear that base layer. And, you know, then it maybe becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. But initially, there was a reason. The base layer was stuffy or the base layer didn't ventilate well. Although it looked very similar to a different base layer you had. Yeah, yeah, 100%. And that's what we've been analyzing is, you know, there are teams that are asking us. I mean, you you saw this. I forget what race it was. You're going to probably recall immediately. But there was one of the tour races last year where I believe it ended on an uphill climb, TT. And I think... G was the one who stopped and opted for a full bike and helmet change because the airflow was cooler. And that was really interesting because everyone's running the math on like aero versus thermal. And yeah, of course, the the result was more obvious, but those calculations are happening all the time. Like at what speed is, is the aero gain maybe not worth the thermal penalty that you're paying? Because everyone knows those TT butt helmets are hot. I mean, even the, the coolest yeah. ones are hot. What's the effect on recovery? If, have you looked at, is there studies, even if it's not you guys personally, is there studies between heat training and the sort of the lagging effect of it, how it affects performance the next day or its impact on heart rate variability? Hey, Roadman, excuse the short interruption. I love riding the bike, but on account of being so busy with the podcast at the moment, I'm now what's called a time crunched rider. I never thought I'd see the day, but I have a tool. I'm using what bike to keep myself sharp and on point with specific sessions to maximize that available training time. I have a what bike Adam right here in the recording studio beside me. And when I have an error in between interviews, I jump on. It's removing all the friction points for me. There's no more 10 minute setup, unfolding legs, banging my knees off stuff, getting my hands dirty, the usual connection issues. It just works every single time. The Adam's perfect for virtual racing as well because it has crisp gear changes. It has 1% accuracy and it has max gradient capability of up to 25%. If you're looking for an indoor trainer, I honestly couldn't recommend this any higher. I've been using a Watt bike since 2013. Honestly, it's the last indoor trainer that you're ever going to need. If you head on over to wattbike.com now and use code ROADMAN10, 
10. That's R-O-A-D-M-E-N-T-E-N. And that's going to get you 10% off your Watt bike. There is research on it. Um, so Puck, who's on our team, is a uh, she did her PhD on this topic. She studied under Hein Dam and is one of the foremost experts in the area. And in talking to her, she's sort of talked a lot about what's interesting to me, which is she's saying the adaptation side of it is is quite fast. It's almost immediate in some regards. Like your vascular dilation can adjust pretty quickly, but what she was pointing out is there wasn't as much science on the fatigue side to understand what's going on. So what we've identified is like thermal load, essentially. So we're starting to understand what maybe that thermal load is based on the thermal properties we're seeing. We don't yet have enough data to start connecting the two of like, okay, thermal load versus performance and HRV and these other things. And that's probably by virtue of the fact of having maybe our blinders on is we're focused on the thermal part and you're bringing up the other part. So this is another thing we throw to like our coaches in the forums online and they'll talk about if like, ah, oh, yeah, I did this many heat sessions, but then HRV did this and power did this. And so... Yeah, do you know why it's... Because it's fascinating because when you move away from pro... So I had Fred Wright on the podcast not too long ago and we were talking about threshold. And we weren't talking about threshold in the sense of heart rate threshold, power threshold. It's totally different threshold. The threshold of when you've balancing, you're trying to balance conflicting demands on your time. You're at me, I'm not going to speak uh, abstractly for anyone else. I'm trying to ride my bike and still be a cat one cyclist, but I'm also becoming more aware as I turn 40 this year that I need to balance in some strength training. So now like how many hours a week do you need to ride your bike to still be cat one? 10, 12? You got to do two, three strength sessions a week. You got to do mobility a couple of times a week. I have a fiance, I have two dogs, I have two podcasts. <laughs> then you start going, okay, if I ride my bike for one hour, I can, no matter how intense it is, I'm still pretty productive for the rest of the day. If I ride for two hours at a moderate intensity, I'm still pretty productive. Yeah. But when me and Fred were chatting, we decided three hours was the line. If you ride for over three hours, even him as a world tour rider, if he rides for three hours or more, the days are right off. He's just sitting on the couch and he's flicking on Instagram and mindlessly watching Netflix. Nothing productive happens after a three hour yeah. ride. So my head was going to with this going, well, if I do a 60 minute heat adaptation session, am I wrote off for the rest of the day? Or inversely, can I do four or five hour heat adaptation sessions at a lower intensity and I still actually have a lot of productivity left in the day because for me it's not actually time that's that important I could do a four-hour ride if I knew I would still be very productive after a four-hour ride yeah no it's really I, I have a further rule to add to that which you didn't mention but I have a son now so I have to finish all of my rides at 80 percent because he expects another 20 percent for the rest of the day it doesn't matter <laughs> what you did on the road so it doesn't matter how spicy the group ride is. I need to preserve 20% for him because he, like, I get home and he's like, cool, we're going out, we're going to play. And uh, yeah, there's zero downtime there. So anyway, that's, that's a new learning that I've had. But it's the same formula. So when I was a triathlete, it was the same thing. And I would run, I remember running the calculations with my coach of how much strength, how much swimming, you know, swimming was not my strength. And we basically determined at some point I was swimming a lot. And my running was getting worse. And that was tr historically my strongest sport. And we were constantly doing this math of like, okay, yeah, you're getting better at the swim, but the amount of time it takes you to get that much better at the swim, you're better off just going back and running a bit more because you, you perk back up really quickly there. So it's, it's this math constantly. Yeah. So what I would say with that is, yeah, what my personal experience was I could do like an hour and a half and, and this is, a, there's a lot of discussion about intensity over volume anyway, but like I could do an hour and a half, you know, trainer road workout, structure workout on the bike with heat. And I could recover pretty quickly from that. Um, and I could do maybe two, three of those, maybe three of those a week. And it was far better and, and more beneficial than doing the three hour rides um, you know, just volume and, and all of this, which, you know, a lot of that zone two stuff. So of course there's a time and a place for both, but I agree with you. I mean, I've, I've anecdotally seen, okay, if I add heat with intensity, it's, it's almost like 
to me, a multiplier is that intensity and I'm getting the gains really quickly. So it, it's, it's really interesting to look at. I won't tell you there's like a definitive answer. That's where the, the, the coach and the data comes in. But I, it's a really cool thing to be able to look at the data now and say like, ah, okay, here's how much heat intensity I've done. Here's how much I've done here. Here's how I am recovering. How many times can I redo that session at the same power levels without seeing you know, other metrics go off the charts and look bad? I had Professor Chris uh, Gardner on the podcast. He's a Stanford professor and people will know him from the Netflix series, You Are What You Eat. He's quite famous for the twin study. And I almost wish we had a twin study for this. I want to see twin A who's riding 10 hours a week with no heat training with a threshold of 300 watts. Twin B doing the exact same training with a threshold of 300 watts. Let's retest them both after six weeks and see the effect on threshold. Oh man, it'll definitely, yeah. It should definitely go up. I mean- the data, the science, all the research says, I guess, in fact, it's more reliable than altitude. You know, it, I think that's the part. Seriously? Yeah, that's the part that I was seeing in, in those research studies. And again, uh, we can maybe link some of these things for your re- readers or watchers yeah, because, you know, in those studies, it's not from us. It's just what's available out there. There's more reliable uh, reactions to uh, heat training than there is altitude in many cases. Because as you're well aware, some people just don't adapt in the same ways or see benefits. And it's always a gamble. Yeah, and look, you need to be well set up to adapt to altitude as well. Like if you're even going into altitude blindly without the precursors to make those red blood cells, you can dig yourself into serious trouble. Yeah, exactly. So there's a lot more consistent, uh, I would say, positive gains on the thermal side uh, in that research. So We'll, we'll link that maybe if it's possible for your, for your viewers so we can share yeah, that yeah, it's across. not me, it's some, some you know, scientists and research. And we look at that stuff quite often to be like, ah, that's, that's really interesting because it's way more accessible. I mean, very few of us can take a two-week holiday to, to an altitude camp, um, but most of us can sweat it out you know, in, in, a, in a heat session for an hour and a half, a couple of days a week, three days a week, let's say. I think altitude training also has genetic responders and non-responders. Have you found that with heat training? We haven't seen that yet, but it's a really interesting... Yeah, I'm curious. I I haven't seen any studies that specifically identify that. There are definitely people that I think adapt better, but that's anecdotal. So, you know, people always say like, I'm better in the heat or I'm better with this, but I don't... I haven't seen any data with that. That'd be really interesting to look at. I think the twin study, you're onto yeah. something. We should get the Brownleys because they're historically, I was at that Mexico <laughs> race and the irony was my wife was watching and I think she ended up with like a heat illness from spectating. I came out from the ice massage after the race and feeling great and she did not look good at all. One of the best clips yeah, ever. Yeah, it was insane to be there. It was so hot, but like, I think, you know, we've we've even seen it with those, you know, Ali's, Ali's done some heat sessions and worked with Gore before and then he's, not sometimes. And it's really interesting to look at some athletes get really good adaptations. Angus Ditlev is, is a, we've seen him using core quite a bit and he's historically and, and everyone's aware that he's training in, you know, in a cooler, let's say climate, but he does a lot of like training sessions, fully clothed on his YouTube videos. You can see him fully clothed on the bike and extending maybe some of his training sessions, being very careful about, again, how much stress he's putting on the body. But he showed up and he's, you know, he's, he's just thermally pacing like a champion. And uh, I forget which T100 race that was early in the season, but he just went through three, four, five, you know, athletes ticking them off just simply by, by smart thermal pacing. It was very clear that he hadn't overcooked and a lot of others had. Do you, do you think there's blood markers in the athletes who are responding to it better? Like, can we identify any patterns or is there any way we can set ourselves up to have more success with the heat training by virtue of taking supplements in advance? I'm not aware of any, um, but I still think that data and research is, is in early stages. I mean, it may, it may come out that there are things that you can do to better help adapt the body. I mean, um, but yeah, again, I, I think that's quite an interesting space, but I would say it's new by virtue of the fact that people are just now starting to get heat training and acclimation data. So the next step is exactly that, which is starting to toy around with it a bit. 
um, and get it out of the darkness, out of the secretive world of maybe uh, ultra performance endurance sports. Uh, no one wants to share the secrets there, um, but in the hands yeah. of people that are happy to share it more. Yeah, I think just finishing up, do you think there's a broader application for this outside of, as you widen that funnel from elite athletes down to now kind of, I suppose, age groupers or recreational athletes like me, do you think how wide is the funnel going to go? Is there an application for, you know, the everyday soccer dads, house moms? Yeah, we're, I think I'm super encouraged by that. I would say yes, right? The world's only getting warmer. And if you go back to that definition of what is training, what is preparation, is preparing for the environment that we're in. Where are you going to race? Where are you going to perform? Where are you going to live? And, you know, I certainly hope we can do more things to, to positively benefit the climate and, and the, the world. But it also would be prudent of us to prepare for a world where the activities we're doing, the things we're doing from work safety to uh, exactly your point, just everyday activity to monitor and be safer about our core temperature. So we have entire business uh, units within our parent company that work in the work safety capacity and the research capacity. Um, we've started integrating the technology. Uh, this is the Withings watch. We've actually got our sensor inside uh, and- I've heard about yeah, that. So good piece of I think it, the, the sky's the limit. And my hope is this, the science shows that this is an important metric. If we care so much about power and power, you know, mechanical power is this much, thermal power should be really, really important. And that has implications on efficiency, fueling, and more importantly, safety. So as far as applications, I mean, just keeping, keeping people safe is an application. Looking at energy expenditure is an application. Looking at all of these other things is a potential application. So I would say there's more potential than has even come to light now. And that's what's exciting about it is the potential applications, not where we're currently at. Where we're currently at is it's the tip of the iceberg. We're just now starting to understand and look at the data. And that's exciting. Ross, I love this conversation. Thank you so much. It's an area I think I'm definitely going to dig more and more into. So I'm excited to explore. Thank you for your Thanks time. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. If you enjoyed this conversation, please click up here. There's another video I know that you're absolutely going to love. And click over here and subscribe to the channel so you don't miss any of our amazing upcoming guests.